precedence. The trams still run on time, people still lie in the sun, on our backs in a room, a stack of books is a home. We can still walk in and out of galleries, look at the sky and think it is a paint shade of blue we have waited to see in the city where the trams still run and we greet each other with smiles and greet each other with smiles while the trams still run our hands are not too tight in each other's and what precedence has this day over any other we have lived in the cold where the cold kept us pacing and our lips moving and your lips moving your hand at your ear where your blood echoes the blue could be winter blue where the ice grows grinding the town the river beneath still seething where nothing appears to move it is moving as we are moving in the coarse light of the tram in the coarse moving light of the tram and that was leanne quinn reading precedence from her new and second collection some lives published in 2020 by Daedalus Press. It's a poem I really like for its movement, its paired back beauty, its mesmeric repetition, all qualities, I think, which are very dominant in this new collection of yours, Leanne. And many thanks for reading it. And you're very welcome today to Books for Breakfast. Um, But just a few words about Leanne. She was born in Drogheda. She grew up in Monaster Boys County Louth. Her debut collection, Before You, was published by Daedalus Press in 2012, and it was highly commended in the Forward Prize for Poetry 2013. Her poems have been widely anthologised, appearing in the Forward Book of Poetry 2013 and Windharp, Poems of Ireland since 1916, among others. She also holds a PhD in American Literature from Trinity College, and her second collection, the one we'll talk about today, Some Lives, as I said, was just published. It's just published by Daedalus Press. She's lived in Dublin for many years and currently lives in Munich, Germany. So it's great to have Leanne here. So to start off, Leanne, in a recent article in The Honest Ulsterman, you said moving to Munich shook you up a bit. It set you off in a different kind of tone and timbre, you said in your poetry. And you began reading the Russian poets. And it's no wonder, really, I suppose, that Some Lives opens with Anna Akhmatova's poem, Without a Hero. Don't dictate to me, I can hear it myself. A warm shower presses on the roof. I hear the ivy whispering. Oh, it just, it's, they're beautiful lines. And of course, it's not only Akhmatova, it's also Tvetaeva, Osip Mandelstam, and the German experimental poet. Um, you, you spend a lot of time concentrating on his poem, Valtanda. So I was just wondering, could you talk to us a little bit about these great Russian writers and indeed Van Hodes and why they've inspired you so much and impressed you so much? Uh, well, I always like to read poetry in translation. And um, when I moved to Munich, we had we, we bought our, our books with us and uh, our apartment was 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 very small. So we, we kind of put a, a book ban on and we were like, OK, we, we definitely can't buy any more books. Um, so I started to just again reread from what I had in, in my, my book collection and uh, one of the books I picked up again was Nadezhda Mandelstam's Hope Against Hope and, and mm. Hope Abandoned. Um, and I'd read this book in my 20s and was really affected by it. Uh, but I just started to read it again and then move again towards uh, the Russian poets. Uh, and yeah, I just I just kind of fascinated by them, obviously by their uh, their poetry and their lives. There, there's a sensibility there that I'm just really drawn to, just really attracted to. Um, I don't know if I can put my finger on it exactly, uh, but there's a directness there. Um, and then, you know, they're, they're vastly different to each other. And, and that's really appealing as well. They're, they're so unique, so inventive. Um, yeah, and I'm just really, really drawn to them. And I suppose the move to Munich as well, um, like sparked my interest in, in German poetry. Mm-hmm. And uh, my wife, Georgina, came home with an anthology of German poetry one day. And I, I found the, the Jakob van Hodes poem, Welt to Ende. And I didn't know this poem. I think it, it is widely known from, from what I read and has been anthologized many times, but it certainly wasn't known to me. So, um, yeah, I, I was just really struck with it. And I remember reading it out to Georgina and saying, look at this. I mean, this could be about the present moment, about the present time and, and the current like environmental crisis. And I was just really, really taken with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's fantastic that going to a new place kind of shakes up all these ideas and gets you going in another direction. Yeah, I I think it's really good. And you can feel that energy in the book as well. And I'd mentioned at the start of our chat the kind of mesmeric repetition of the poem precedence that you read for us. And in your collection, I like the way you play with form, this kind of a dream like returning to lines used over and over again. I'm thinking of the highly energized poem Elegy, a poem with no punctuation that feels to me kind of like a breathless stream of consciousness fueled by repetition and grief you say nobody died nobody mourned we love a kill we love a kill we love a kill and we love nothing more than to mourn but nobody died nobody mourned really really great lines there Leanne can you you speak about the importance of repetition in the form of the book and the turning back of poems on themselves they kind of reveal new meanings to the reader I think yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in repetition. I'm really interested in sound. I'm really interested in rhythm. And I suppose repetition kind of plays into all of that. And I think as well, in terms of, of the themes of the poems and the themes that are in the collection, I was thinking about the past and I think thinking about the present and I was thinking about like repeating cycles. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I suppose I just started to kind of like literalize that through the my use of of form um and just kind of experimenting with, with repetition and and when you repeat something do you, do you actually repeat it or is it changed or, or altered um i'm yeah i'm very kind of drawn to that and i'm just interested in it so i suppose that's why it does feature you know quite a lot uh, in the collection yeah and also there is as i said this kind of paired back beauty i think which succeeds in bringing details memorably to the fore and i'm thinking of the the poem the distant past where a man is threatening to toss a mouse live into a pan or rings which includes a train journey and ends look how far i've traveled to see you how sand falls like gold from my sleeves that detail just seems to come out because it is so paired back and Leanne is this a kind of paired back style is it a hard one or is it something that just kind of naturally comes to you as a poet I think it really just naturally comes to me. I don't know whether yeah. it's tied to my personality or what, but I, I'm quite a, a reticent person and um, it, it seems to kind of suit me. Um, and it, it's just, it, it's really the only way I, I seem to be able um, to write. I, I, I always end up, you know, um, you know, pairing things back even more. I think it's just the particular style I have and, just just the way poems come to me and and this kind of this the stripped back nature um of language that i'm kind of uh drawn to and, and maybe that was something with, with the you know the work in translation as well because i often find that it's it's more economical with language and i'm kind of really drawn to that as well um a, a more kind of direct i suppose in some ways sensibility so yeah i think it it's it's, it's just as well just natural to me i think that's the best approach I think and of course it's not just the Russian poets who inspire you Leanne um, your poem The Fear Bulg it takes its title from a painting by Nana Reed, and the poem uh, The Good Going Up to Heaven and The Wicked Coming Down is a title also taken from a painting by her she grew up didn't she in Monster Boyce your hometown and I know she's important to you could you just say a few words about that yeah absolutely well she grew up in, in Drogheda actually in the town of Drogheda where I'm originally from as well so we moved out to Monaster Boyce when, when I was in my teens. But yeah, she's a huge inspiration to me. Um, I love her painting. I just absolutely love her paintings. I'm, I'm so drawn to them. Um, I think she's just an exceptional artist. And then I'm also drawn to the life and what it was like for her to, to grow up in, in Drogheda. And, you know, she lived through so many important events of, of the 20th century. So I'm kind of intrigued by that, what it was like to be an artist in, in her time, in her day, obviously, um we you know with, with the founding of like the new state and and um how difficult that was for for women and the kind of role they were cast in so what it was like to be like a female artist i guess she was seen as a bit of an oddity and a bit of an eccentricity within the town but she was really just a very like modern woman who who had lived in london who had spent time in paris and, and a lot of time um in dublin as well so yeah i'm just really in, intrigued by her and how she negotiated that. 
great that your, your poems have brought her again to the fore. And um, I can't um, have you here without asking you about Munich. Peter and I are both very jealous we're not there. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a city that enters these poems with its weather, its people, its sounds, its sense of place. In your poem, The Fall, um, the narrator says, in the bakery I point crumbs of a language, four words for goodbye will do. And I, I suppose there are many ways to say goodbye in German, aren't there? And you'll have to excuse my German now, but I'm thinking of bis später or bis dann or bis bald. Um, I got lessons there from my daughter who, who studies German, but it, it did make me wonder, though. I mean, you were talking there about translation, but living in Munich, as you do, does living where you are and constantly hearing another language affect your own writing? And has it changed your own writing as a result? Um. Yeah, maybe. I suppose it does make you think more more about your 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 own language. And obviously, when when I came here, I didn't I didn't speak German. I had some school German, and I'm still learning. It's it's definitely still an ongoing process that has been like bad badly interrupted by the pandemic because <laughs> I talk to so few people, uh, and especially in in German at at the moment. So yeah, I think any time you kind of um, you learn a new language, it, it makes you kind of reflect reflect on your own as well. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm sure it has had, had, had an impact. Yeah, it's exciting, I think, for you, Leanne, to be over there. And I'm looking forward to seeing what new stuff is going to come from your time in Munich as well. So um, speaking as we were about Nana Reed, it would be lovely to hear your poem Cave of the Fear Bullock, Leanne. If you would read it for us, that would be great. Cave of the Fear Bullock. Not even a trespass of sky to compromise the dark where blood beats in the body of the heart. Nobody thinks, why do we do this? The nervous system ferries its thin shards of glass down among the clay where the blunt flint of the soul remains. Pollen embedded in the riverbed, a prehistory of refuse in the lower layers. Every end is a chance to start over, but the river cannot start again, or the voice in the cave speak in a righteous tongue. The body too gives way as the blood deposits its memory in the tributaries of the cave. The sky pushed out, the, ha- the heart yet to know it can go without. And Queen reading Cave of the Fear Bulk from Some Lives, published by Daedalus Press. And now, Leanne, it was great chatting to you. I think it's time to move on to the Toaster Challenge, where we will not interrupt you. And we're looking forward to hearing you talk about a book which you really love for about three minutes. So Peter's getting the bread ready. The toaster will go down. So one, two, three, off you go. The book I've chosen is Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexievich, translated by Bela Shevich. Svetlana Alexievich is a Belarusian writer. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2015. Alexievich's books are essentially oral histories. She has described herself as as an historian of feeling or a historian of the untraceable. Secondhand Time explores the collapse of the Soviet Union and the effect of that collapse on ordinary men and women of former Soviet states. The book is an astonishing collection of voices. Alexievich is an extraordinary writer What seems to go hand in hand with that is her ability to listen, to elicit narrative from others, to absent herself from the narrative so that others can assume that narrative role. This stepping aside is what I find truly remarkable about her writing. She is a curator of voices. In this book, she listens to narratives of pain and loss, narratives of love, of hope, of guilt and narratives of disillusionment. She says that she's always listening for that moment when everyday life is transformed into literature. For her, this happens when a person delves deep into themselves and these moments of delving is what she's there to record. The voices in this book really left such a deep impression on me. The experiences that they describe are often harrowing, upsetting and disturbing. As I was reading the book, I also realized that I was actually reading a compendium of suicides. And this is really one of the structuring principles of the book. These stories are often told to us by a surviving family member or by a friend, and they're particularly difficult to read. But through these narratives, the book really gets to the kernel of the trauma experienced by people when there's a seismic ideological shift away from the principles of the past into the present order. And it's that trauma that Alexievich is recording in this book, who was able to adapt and who wasn't. She juxtaposes all of these differing points of view, 
these different experiences of the past and of the present moment, and the result is this tremendous polyphonic account of Soviet Russia as experienced on the level of the individual. In second-hand time, people try to understand or to come to terms with or defend, as the case may be, not only the inhumane acts of the communist regime, but also the horrific conflicts that emerged after the breakup of the Soviet Union. I think the book is just an astonishing achievement, and this is really true of all her books. The stories in here really don't let you go after you've read them. And while it's certainly a tough read because of the nature of those stories, I feel that it's a necessary read, and I really can't recommend it enough. Thanks, Anne. I mean, I think a, a, a very struck. I mean, it's it's an, it's an amazing book for anybody who hasn't read it. And one of the things I'm grateful for is the chance that you gave me to actually um, go out and, and explore it. And because she is such an extraordinary writer, and this is such an amazing book. I mean, it's 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 full of those the, the things that, that that you say. I mean, the the kind of voices of pain and and you know, kind of despair, disillusionment, but also that kind of. I mean, that kind of thing that. Um, Everything they had, that they had believed in for so long just kind of vanished un, under under their feet. I mean, I, I'm just looking at some of the things I pulled out from it. Like, no one had taught us how to be free. We don't even ever. Um, we'd only ever been taught how to die for for freedom, and then freedom turned out to mean the rehabilitation of bourgeois existence, which has traditionally been suppressed in in Russia. Completely new people appeared. All these young guys in gold rings and magenta blazers. There were new rules. If you have money you can't. No money, you're nothing. Who cares if you've read all of Hegel? Uh, humanity started sounding like a disease. All you people are capable of carrying around, um, you know, a volume of Mandelstam. You're no use. You're no use to us an anymore. But that, that sense of, of despair of at the kind of empty acquisitiveness that has replaced um, communism is a kind of constant refrain, isn't it, throughout the book that people just don't know what, or people of a particular generation are at a, are at a total loss. Yeah, absolutely. Like when a belief system is is there, or you know, even if it's one that is imposed, when when it's taken away, and um, people really are at a loss, and and people really struggle, and it also almost became like a competition in one way to see who could adapt and 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 who couldn't. And yeah, it's it's it's. I think she just, you know, she she really captures the complexity of it because it is so complex especially as you know an Irish person coming to this um but I, I I think she you know she she gives voice to so many people and the remarkable thing that she does is like she gives it without judgment which is really really hard to do uh, but I think she achieves it so well it's a funny thing because because it's it's you know you said you admired her ability to kind of stand aside and it is it is unusual because I can't, you know, it's hard to think. It's, it kind of reminds me of a little bit of somebody like Studs Terkel, the American writer who wrote, you know, um, books about the uh, Great Depression, Second World War. But, you know, just kind of listening to people uh, uh, as well. But it's not a tradition that's big in English, but but the kind of thing of simply, you know, you're reading a long book and, and it's entirely dominated by by the voices of people. So the writer's task is to kind of in this case, to remove herself, um, you know, so there's no intervention from her re really. So it's the writer as listener. Um, that's 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 kind of the amazing thing. And she has, because, you know, she's obviously, she did a book about Chernobyl. She's Belarusian, as you said, and that hasn't made her very popular um, there either. She's She wrote about Afghanistan. She wrote about the, you know, what happened to women in the Second World War. All of the, all of these things which made her slightly, pretty unpopular in various places, in, in, in Russia, People are divided in their reaction to what she said in in Belarus. Um, it's very it's very difficult for her. So so her listening has got her into trouble, hasn't it? A lot. Absolutely, it has. And I, I think currently, I think she left Belarus in September of of twenty twenty. And I think um, she she is in Germany now, actually. So I think she actually said she she feared for her safety. Um, so so she left, but. Yeah, it certain, certainly has. It, it's not the the easy path. And what, what I really draw to her writing is, like the best writing is, is writing, I think, that gets beyond the self. And I mean, this is such a prime example that of writing that goes beyond the self um, and that ability just to abstract yourself like that, I think is what's really, really remarkable about the books and, and why I'm drawn to them. And like you mentioned her other books there, she writes brilliantly on war as well. 
um, yeah, the Boys in, in Zinc and uh, The Unwomanly Face of War, again, like remarkable books. I could have recommended either of those books as well, but this is the most recent book of hers that, that, that I've read. Yeah, well, certainly, I mean, and, and that's great. I mean, because you, you've, you've made a great case for for that book and for Svetlana Alexievich in, in, in general. So it was so it would be great. It's a great recommendation, I think, to take away from 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 this. Um, so just to, to conclude, that was that was the Anne Quinn talking, first of all, to end about her own new book, Some Lives, published by Daedalus Press. And she was also talk, talking about a book she loves, Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexievich, which is published by Fitzcarraldo, who published so many great books. Um, and the details of, of both books will be available on our uh, website, um, booksforbreakfast.buzzsprout.com. So thanks again for that, Leanne. Thanks so much for having me on.